started it. Oh. Ready? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. church how are y'all all righty so I got the privilege of uh, Miss Wanda's job this morning so y'all bear with me um first I want to make sure everyone is aware of a few people that need some major prayers um there's a bunch on the back so definitely keep everybody on the back of your uh what is this called bulletin Make sure everybody prays for everybody that's on this list. Um, Gene, our our drummer, um, he is still getting over COVID, so just say a big prayer for him. Uh, hope he gets well and gets back soon. Um, Wanda, Miss Wanda, who normally does all the announcements, she had surgery this past week, so we just definitely need to pray for her and make sure she has quick healing and is back soon as well. Uh, I want to uh, say a major prayer for um, Buddy and his family, his wife, Barbara. Um, just keep them in your prayers. It's going to be a hard road ahead of them, so we just need to make sure that we're e reaching out and just praying for them. Um, also, uh, Weldon, stand up if you or yeah, raise your hand if y'all can see Weldon. Um, he asked us to make an announcement. He has to get a refrigerator moved and needs someone who is nice enough, kind enough to let him or go give him a truck to use and a low bed trailer and a dolly so he can move it from just down the road. Isn't that right, Weldon? So anywho, if you can or know someone who can, reach out to Weldon. Um, and then last but not least, let's pray for Charky again. We're missing him but we know he's doing well and that he's going to come back soon and come back with a just a, a great blessing for all of us and let's just make sure he comes home to a good blessing so anywho um and then okay upcoming events we have an eating meeting today and then a uh, singles is at 6 30 and that's on thursday right thursday i'm, I'm, I'm thinking uh, there's a Joyce Meyer, Meyer conference Saturday, or, I mean, 7 o'clock. It doesn't say the day, so I apologize. Uh, there's a men's prayer breakfast at 8. Again, I don't know the date, so I apologize. Saturday. Saturday. Um, just look through your 
upcoming events. And if you have any questions, reach out to Becky because <laughs> she will be able to help you with that a bunch. Um, but uh, let's get back to music. Thank you. Well, a man walked down by Galilee, so the holy book does say. And a great multitude was gathered there without a thing to eat for day. Up stepped a little boy with a basket. This Lord, he said, and with just five loaves and two little fish, five thousand had fish and bread. Who was it, everybody? It was Jesus. Who was it, everybody? It was Jesus. Who was it, everybody? It was Jesus. It was Jesus Christ, our Lord. And I pay close attention, little children. Hey, somebody you ought to know. It's all about a man that walked the earth nearly 2,000 years ago. Well, he healed the sick and afflicted, and he raised them from the dead. Then they nailed him on an old rugged cross and put thorns upon his head. Who was it, everybody? It was Jesus. Who was it, everybody? It was Jesus. Who was it, everybody? It was Jesus. It was Jesus Christ, our Lord. Well, they took him down and they buried him And after the third day When they came upon a tomb And they knew he was gone The stones rolled away He's not here for he has risen The angel of the Lord then said And when they saw him walking with his nail-scarred hands They knew he'd risen from the dead Who was it, everybody? It was Jesus Who was it, everybody? It was Jesus Who was it, everybody? It was Jesus it was Jesus Christ our Lord. Me through. He's guiding me through 
helping with the, some of the sound so some weeks you'll see him up here some weeks you may not totally normal but good to have him up here this week thank you Kevin praise God praise God
M. Good, oh, good, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Or good evening. Good morning. The verse I'll be talking about today is Psalms 37 8. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. What this verse means to me is whenever I get angry, I change the environment. And God doesn't want us to be angry. God wants us to feel joy and happiness. An example of anger is when my brother annoys me and I tend to get angry at him. But, and I hurt him. But how I can control my anger is I should calm down and assess, assess the situation and let God take control. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Alex. Good job. Tell me what does it look like in heaven? Is it peaceful? Is it free like they say? Does the sun shine bright forever? Have your fears and your pain gone away? Cause here on earth it feels like everything Good is missing since you left And here on earth everything's different There's an emptiness And oh, I, I hope you're dead
once I stood in the night my head bowed low in darkness as black as the sea and my heart was afraid I cried oh Lord don't From here to the great unknown Take my hand and let me stand Where no one stands Like a king, I may live in a palace so tall with great riches to call my own. But I don't know a thing in this whole wide world is worse than me. This time we'll dismiss the kids. Well, I'm tired and still weary, but I must go alone till the Lord comes and calls me, calls me away. Whoa, yes. Well, the morning's so bright and the lamb is the light and the night, the night is as black. As black as the sea, oh yes, there will be peace in the valley for me someday. There will be peace in the valley for me, oh Lord, I pray. There'll be no sadness, no sorrow, no trouble. And the wolf will be tame And the lion, the lion shall lay down Down by the limb, oh yes And the beast from the wild Shall be led by little child And I'll be changed, changed from this creature That I am Oh yes, there will be peace in the valley for me someday. There will be peace in the valley for me. Oh Lord, I pray there will be no sadness, no sorrow. Peace, peace in the 
valley for me, for me. There'll be no sadness, no sorrow, no troubles I'll see. There will be peace, peace in the valley for me. Thank you. We'll take our break and then we'll have Brother Jerry Liversage up. Sir, all right. Let me go tell Bill on something real quick. All right. <clears throat> well, once again, good morning. Good morning to you all. It's good to see every one of you here. I'm still learning names and faces and places and so, um, but some of you are becoming more familiar and I'm trying to remember a few names so it's getting closer. Pardon me? She's being told to tell me to wait a few minutes. Well, if you don't mind waiting a few more minutes because she's cutting into my time then let's just go ahead and go on. You, are you going to be the time clock? No. No? All right. Hey, while I'm told to wait a few minutes before preaching, um, I do want to uh, tell you, for those that aren't sure or aren't aware, uh, Pastor Charkey is on um, sabbatical. And so what is sabbatical? Uh, for those of you who do not know, uh, Lone Star Cowboy Church is part of the Church of the Nazarene. The Church of the Nazarene is a worldwide denomination. And uh, in the Church of the Nazarene, after so many years of service for a pastor, they are welcomed and encouraged to take a sabbatical. It's a period of time. It's not vacation. Uh, they take sabbatical um, and they can take still their vacation time between the board and the pastor and yourself. But he is on sabbatical. Sabbatical is a time of reflection. Sabbatical is a time of prayer, seeking. And so that's why Pastor Charkey is not here. Now, when he comes back, he may take a vacation, so please refrain from saying, well, wait a minute, he was just on sabbatical. So the Church of the Nazarene wel welcomes and encourages sabbatical for pastors who have been at churches in the Church of the Nazarene for uh, periods of time. So he's going to be gone for two more weeks. Uh, next week is the district superintendent will return. He is the district superintendent for the Northeast District Church of the Nazarene. He'll be next week's speaker. And then the following week, he will return again to be a speaker. And then your pastor, Charkey, is raring and ready to go when he returns. Uh, he told me the other day that he's ready to go now. But he's going to go ahead and walk through the process of sabbatical. So you be praying for him. 
Can I see how many hands pray for your pastor on a consistent basis? I'm seeing some vacant hand raising, so I'm hoping that's not a negative. I'm hoping you're just shy. So please pray for your pastor. And that's an introduction for me. I'm sorry I didn't clear this with you, Sheila. Uh -huh. <laughs> I want to pray for Sheila. And I don't believe I've met, is this your? This is Allie. This is our oldest daughter. Hello. Allie. She's she... in the nursery. In the nursery. Would you come forward? I want to just take a few minutes, and as we pray for Sheila, pastor's wives, I want to tell you, pastor's wives need prayer just as well as pastors need prayer. Amen. My wife's hand is raised high. Um, I started pastoring in 1996 on the Southern California District and have served at different churches in my tenure and as a Nazarene evangelist as well. And I can tell you that the wife is a very a crucial part of ministry. And so you are that person. So as we pray for pastor this morning, I felt led to call you up. I'm sorry I didn't you. give you a little, or a little heads, up. heads up. Yeah. Jesus, we thank you for Sheila. We thank you for all that she does to support and be alongside of her mate that you've assigned for a lifetime. And I pray that you would encourage her and touch her and fill her with your presence. I pray, Jesus, for your covering and anointing upon the family. Mm -hmm. I pray, Jesus, that you would hold them close to your heart. Mm -hmm. So we just pray for her. We pray that you would undergird her, give her wisdom in all things. Mm -hmm. Pray for the children, the grandchildren, all of her family. Mm -hmm. Cover her, Jesus, we pray. Mm -hmm. And we pray for our pastor, Charky, mm -hmm. as he continues to be away. Mm -hmm. Speak to the depths of his heart, Jesus. Bring him back to your church. You're the head of the church. But bring your servant back ready to go and serve you with all of his strength. And we'll be careful to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Uh, for those of you also that don't know, just to give you a quick little announcement... Um, our ministry, we're still new in, in Texas. We resigned from our church in October of last year, moved here to be with my family, and we're just seeking the Lord in His direction in our lives in terms of family and ministry and so on and so on. And so, um, but for those that don't know, we have uh, Facebook and a devotional that I upload um, pretty much every day. And so if you're interested in a devotional and you're on the internet, it's just simply Jerry Liversage Ministries Incorporated. You put that in your Facebook search bar and our um, page will come up and you can be part of some daily devotional thoughts. I'm sure you read your Bible every day anyway. And so this is a kind of a devotional it's some scripture for the thought for the day. Sometimes they're lengthy. You know how pastors do. They say, give me 10 minutes, and a half hour later, they're done. But um, I just thought I'd announce that it might be an interest um, to you. Uh, our website is also jerryliversageministries.org if you're interested. And so I wanted to just put that out there uh, to you. Today, I know we have... Potluck, I mean, that's what we used to call it as a pastor at our churches. You call it meet and eat or something, I think. But um, I know there's a lot of uh, commotion in the kitchen and all, but I'm going to ask this morning for your undivided attention. I'm going to ask this morning that if you would uh, be kind enough to even take notes. Um, now, this isn't a class, it's not a college, but I remember my professor telling me, and all the students at the syllabus was being handed out. He said, you know, I don't know what you've all done in some of your other classes, but when you come to my class, you're going to learn something. And so you would read the syllabus and it would be daunting. And he would say, you know how you, you handle a syllabus? It's like eating an elephant one bite at a time. And so I'm going to ask if you would take your Bibles, maybe a piece of paper, maybe write some notes if you want to. I would encourage you, if anything, to jot down some scripture. 
We're living in a turbulent time. I don't think I need to tell you that. You watch the news, you see it all unfolding before your eyes as well as I do. We are clearly live, living in biblical prophecy. We're living out these last days. Joel in the Old Testament talked about the last days. Some people say, well, what, is the, what are the last days? Well, the last days began when Jesus died, buried, and rose again. We are, since that time, living in the last days. Some people say, well, when's he going to come back? I mean, come on. What's this, 2,000, over 2,000 years later? Well, listen, let us not forget the Bible says the day is uh, as of a 1,000 years to the Lord. So when you come around God's timetable, throw away your calendar, throw away your watch. Jesus, the Bible says, doesn't even know the day when he will return. Only God knows that. Isn't that interesting? Jesus is God. He's man. But the Bible tells us in Philippians that Jesus, being equal with God, gave up his rights as God and became obedient even unto death. So Jesus doesn't even know the day nor the hour. But we're going to talk a little bit about some of that this morning. I'm going to ask if you would too, also to stand if you would. We're going to read in unison Romans chapter 1, verses 16 through 17. Stand if you would, please. We're going to read this together. I know this is a little bit different, but this is going to be our key verse this morning. And then we're going to come back and read some of the continuing scriptures of what we're going to look at this morning. Let's read in unison together. You ready? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Jesus, help us now. We need you. Oh, how we need you. Awaken us from a sleep or in a slumber. Let your church rise once again. Let us take hold of the gospel. Help us to not become dull or dull. Help us not to become weary in our well-doing. But fortify us and fill us with the Holy Spirit. Even this day, I pray for your anointing, for the outpouring of your spirit on each and every one of our lives. Hide me behind the cross of Calvary, that all that will be seen, seen is you and your word, Jesus. It's in your name we pray these things. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The title of this message this morning is The Anemic Church. The Anemic Church. Now, I want to just highlight a couple of words in the scripture that we just read, and then we're going to move on as in, in our study together. It says that I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God, the salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first, also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. I want to highlight, and we're going to move on. I can't spend much time with this, but if those that run the sound can just leave this scripture there, because we'll come back to it a time or two. But I want this just to sink, sink, uh, sink within our heart, to set like cement sets. You know, you pour cement to your contractors in a form and a mold, and, and then you got to wait. And then it's got to set. And I'm praying that the word of God is going to set within our hearts today. And we're going to continue to walk in boldness and in power as we're waiting for the return of Jesus Christ. And make no mistake, he's coming soon. Some people say, I've heard that all my life. So when's he coming? Well, aren't you glad he waited for you? See, he's waiting. Until the appropriate time when God says, go get your kids. So you need to be praying for your kids, your unsaved loved ones. 
continue to pour out the Holy Spirit and ask for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit because time is short, as we're going to see in just a few moments. I want to highlight just real quickly this word power. Power is the Greek word for power is dunamai. It's an uncertain affinity to be able or possible to be of power. Dunamai. It could also be a root word from dunamai is dunamus. It's a literally uh, and figuratively, figuratively form of a miraculous power that only comes from one place. It's not in strength. It's not in your ability. It's a supernatural power. Dunamis can also be described as supernatural ability, abundance, a mighty work or a miracle of power and strength, and a mighty work. It's interesting because the word power, as we just read, is the same word, same Greek word, dunamis, it's the same Greek word that's recorded in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. Now you may know Acts, it's the Acts of the Apostles. Acts was written by the uh, Luke Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This could really be Luke volume 2. But it's the Acts of the Apostle, and the Holy Spirit spoke to Luke, and Luke record, recorded the Acts of the Apostles. And he recorded this word power. In chapter 1, verses 4 through 8, he says this, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times of the season which the Father has put in his own authority. Watch this. But you shall receive power, there's that word, dunamis, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. This power comes from one place only. It gives you stability in life. It gives you the ability to be a witness for Jesus Christ. I love the Holy Spirit and his promise to us that he gives us this dunamis power. By the way, we get our word dynamite from the word dunamis. It's explosive. It enables you to walk in victory over sin, death, hell, and the grave. You and I are no match against Satan. Come on, admit it. Don't look so holy to me. You are no match. For the enemy who comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. The only one who can deliver you and me from the power of sin is the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ. In the last days, this promise was given to the church at, in, in Acts and recorded that he shall, when Jesus dies, buries, rises again, he shall pour out his spirit and give us dunamis power. That happened approximately 2,000 years ago. That warrants even spending time just in that. But i got to move on. The last part of verse 17 says, The just shall live by faith. Now listen to this carefully. And if you're writing, taking notes, if you have your Bibles, maybe even in your margin, you might want to put this in the, in the margin or flyleaf of your Bible. The Greek word for faith is pistis. I can see that excited you. Pistis means persuasion. It means credence, moral conviction. Conviction of religious truth or the truthfulness of God or a religious teacher. Especially reliance upon Christ for salvation. It, it is professing the system of religious gospel of truth itself. Pistis. This is the word that Paul is using in Romans. The just shall live by 
pistis, or faith. The Greek, the New Testament, written in the Greek language, that word is faith and pistis. And the reason why that's so important is because if you do not have, not have pistis, you have nothing. I find it interesting that sometimes people say, you know, I don't like that pastor's delivery. I don't like what he's saying. I, I just, and maybe some feel like that even right now. And I'm not here for a popularity contest. Neither was Jesus. I'm just, tell, I'm just a messenger boy. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. I find it interesting that if that's the attitude of some about the pastor or the evangelist, I propose this. Take the pastor or the evangelist off of the platform. By the way, thank you for putting this down here. I have a little back issue right now. So up and down. This is a lot easier down here. But remove the pastor. Take him off the podium. Have him sit down. And just display the scripture. And let the scripture speak. Now who are you going to be mad at? Are you going to be mad at the delivery? Or maybe, I, I don't like that font. It's, it's, I, it needs to be larger. I don't like the screen. I don't like the sound man who runs the screen. You know, what, will be, what would be your argument then? We either agree with the word of God or we don't. I'm just a messenger boy. And this morning we're looking at this issue of, of, of importance of faith. All through the New Testament and really the Old Testament, we don't have the time or the luxury to do that. But this word, pistis, I want it to hopefully be ingrained in our heart. Faith, pistis. The interesting thing is the opposite of pistis or faith is a pistis. It can be defined as an unbeliever, infidel, or faithless. To include not to be trusted. It's interesting because apesis or derivative of this word is mentioned 23 times in the New Testament in 21 different verses. If we don't have this operating in our life, then we are just going through exercise of attending church. My grandfather, who's in heaven now, once told me, walking into a church no more makes you a Christian than walking into a garage makes you a car. So just because you come to church and you show up and you put some trinkets in the offering plate, that doesn't mean you're going to heaven. It's the authority of God's word. And it's our response to the authority of God's word. That is the common denominator that has the ability of changing the heart of a man, woman, boy, or girl. We are desperately in need of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who is soon going to return. Let me explore and let me expound just a little bit of this word, uh, pistis. James, the half-brother of Jesus, says these words in James chapter 2, beginning with verse 18. But someone will say, you have faith. And I have works. Show me your faith without your works. And I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there's one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and they tremble. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham, our father, justified by works when he offered Isaac, his son, on the altar. Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works, not by faith only. Likewise, listen to this, was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. 
So what's James saying? Well, if you were to go and dissect this further and put it in context, and by the way, that's the important part of any Bible study, is context, context, context. If you're in real estate here today and you're a real estate salesman or saleswoman, you know that it's location, location, location. But in Bible study, it's context, context, context. That's the problem that we're living in today. Some evangelist television preacher will take one little scripture and twist it and bend it to make whatever they want and send me a thousand dollars and God's going to pour out a blessing to you. We don't come to the scriptures based on our terms. We come to the scriptures and we let the Bible be the commentary to us. The Bible tells us that the best commentary for the Bible is the Bible. May God help us to listen to his word. So pistis, and we're going to move on. It's interesting that pistis, when it takes root, it will have a result. A pistis will keep someone in the dull dungeons of deceit and defeat. But pistis that comes from one place has the ability of changing our heart, empowering us and emboldening us. This is what James is saying here. He's saying it's not enough that you believe. He just, you just heard me read it. He said even the demons in hell believe and they tremble in God's presence. He says, so believing is not enough. This is the half-brother of Jesus. Pistis, or saving faith is what he's saying, will result in a change. What's that change? It will manifest itself in the works of God. You can't help yourself than to do things for the Spirit of God, not for, but be part of. Why? Because Pistis has touched your heart and has changed your life. And so you have no other recourse than to just get involved in what God is doing. I hope that some of you will get involved in what's going on at Lone Star Cowboy Church. Her husband almost killed himself putting up this playground out here. Your pastor needs your help. And we come alongside and we encourage and pray and say, Pastor, how can I be part of the work that's happening at Lone Star Cowboy Church? That's the ministry. It's not just the pastor's job. It's the body of Christ that comes together and unites together. So let me move on. In case you haven't noticed, this country, to include the entire world, are now openly and defiantly rebelling and flagrantly defying the word of God. Now, I don't have to come and go through different points of that, even though I kind of did a few Monday nights ago, a month or two ago when I preached here. And, but, but I would want to say this, that this is how emboldening the world is getting. How many watched the Paris Olympics? The opening ceremony depicted behavior of LGBTQ. It was on full display to a world who cheered, who encouraged and even endorsed LGBTQ and homosexuality and pride, gay pride and all of these things. This is the statement now for the world. It's no longer a secret. It's now come out in the open. It's not just a United States of America problem. It's a sin problem that is taking root in the things of the world. As you may know, the entire Christian community called for a boycott of the Olympics and encouraged Christians to make a stand and refrain watching and supporting the event, especially due to the open LGBTQ performance, which, by the way, is a last day's sign. However, some churches, to include denominations, chose to remain silent. And I don't have time to to go there, but let me just mention that during World War II, I don't know if you know this or not, I'd recommend a a book called uh, uh, Letters to the American Church. Eric Metaxas, a Christian author, who did extensive research on things that the church 
during the world wars. During World War II, there were churches in Germany that were along the railroad tracks that took uh, Jews to the concentration camps. And they would be screaming and crying in these trains as they were being ushered into these concentration camps to be murdered and tortured. And, and the pastors would say, let's just sing a little louder. The time for the church to be silent is no more. And there's a problem when there's silence, I believe. In addition, for the first time in history, we as a country were experiencing an unprecedented exchange in presidential power leading to November 24, when we will cast our vote on whom will lead the United States into 2025. It's amazing what's going on. Sometimes, I don't know if you feel like this, but sometimes I just, I have to turn off the news. Now, I don't watch major news stations, NBC, CBS, ABC, even Fox News. Um, uh, I want to keep in touch with what's going on in Israel. I want to keep in touch what's going on around the world. So I watch news channels that give us real news, not bias news. And if you're keeping your eye on what's happening around the world and mainly keeping your eye in the Word of God, you would have to agree that whatever the, the church is going to do through the Holy Spirit, it's time to turn from apathy, it's time to repent, and it's time to rise. And that time is now. But there's some Christians that ignore the admonishment. Let me ask you this question. If Christians are ignoring this admonishment, not my words, but words that we just read and we could continue to read and put them up on the screen and let Pastor Charkey sit down and don't, you don't have to get mad at him no more. Get mad at what's happening on the screen. But let me ask you this question. How has the Christian community ignored or forgotten these words? How has the Christian church forgotten what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? Dr. Billy Graham once said, if God does not, listen, if God does not judge the church, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. That's the days in which we're living. We're living in open flagrant. They're being taught, things are being taught to our children in our school system. And it's no wonder, in 1962 and in 1963, by Supreme Court order, we kicked God out of our school system. No more prayer, no more Bible reading in 62 and in 63. And the Supreme Court gave some verbiage kind of like this. You can Google it and find out manuscript and read it for yourself. But if parts of the Bible would be read to the children without explanation, it can be and has been psychologically harmful to the child. And so based on a Supreme Court decision, they removed prayer and Bible reading from our school system. And we have been suffering ever since. It's also time for dad to take up your, your called place in your family. Do you know that the Bible in Old Testament days, the father was assigned to be the priest of his home? He was assigned to get his family together and to tell them the Exodus and the stories of Moses and to pray with his kids. He was the priest of his family. What happened to that? What happened to the church of setting a standard? What's happened to the church that has become apathy or lukewarm? Have we gone so far? Have we closed our mind and our heart to a renewed act of grace and mercy at an incredible expense of Jesus Christ? And make no mistake, he's calling right now. As we continue in this message, and I'm, I'm already needing to cut this shorter, but I want to just read, if you have your Bibles, Turn with me to Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. It's an incredible picture that Jesus gave to John to write 
concerning the seven churches. Now, this is just one of the churches that Jesus told John specifically to write this down. And it was to the church at Laodicea. It's found in Revelation chapter 3, beginning with 14. And it says these words, And to the angel of the church, now let me just say, the angel there, in the Greek language, can be defined as the messenger. It can be defined as the authority. It can be defined as the one who's delivering the message. So the Bible says here that, and to the angel or to the messenger or to the pastor, it could be translated, of the church of Laodiceans, write, these things say the amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of creation of God. Watch this. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I'm rich, you become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white in garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood... They were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. In addition, I want to give you some other words that Jesus gave recorded in Matthew chapter 24, beginning with verse number 36. He says, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, there were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. If there ever was a time for the church to be filled with the Holy Spirit, rise from apathy, repent and rise, it is now. I know I've said that already. You're saying, Pastor, you've said it once already. I know. How many more times do we need to say it before it is ingrained in our hearts? Let me ask you a question. Some may not like what I'm about to say, but if you have a burning desire to spread the gospel into the cancer of sin, if you have that desire, or if that desire is absent, what would be the root cause? Would the answer for that root cause of being absent of spreading the gospel into the cancer of sin, would that answer include an anemic church? An anemic church has lost their vision. They've lost their way. They've lost their moral compass of life. They've, they've lost and become dull to the, to the admonition of Jesus Christ. Anemic is defined as lacking force, vitality, or spirit. 
It is lacking interest or savor. And anemic is defined as, listen, lacking in substance or quantity. What are some of the signs of an anemic individual or church? Well, to gain an answer to this question pertaining to life or any answers to life, we must always go to the Word of God because man's opinion is not what is paramount. So based on this truth, let's briefly explore three opinion, or three of God's directives as to why, just three, as to how a church can slip into an anemic posture. No power. No authority. It's just come into church, come out of church, it's not on a bolt, boom, 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 it's an assembly line, I come and I go and there's no change. There's no power. Write this scripture down. I'm going to give you just three points and then we're done. Are you all okay? I'll be done quick. This isn't going to hurt. So are you ready? Write this first scripture down. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. These are some pictures of how we can stay away from become an anemic on a personal level or as a church. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and teaching. Listen to this. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. And an anemic individual or church will, will do what? What happens on that pathway? We just read one of those instances that people will refuse sound doctrine. Well, I don't like what he said, so I'm never going back to that church. Well, what would the pastor do? He didn't like what he said. Did you not like the pastor or what he said? Did what he said line up with the word of God? Well, yeah. Well, then who are you mad at? See, this just told us that in the last days, there'll be people who will turn aside from what? From sound doctrine. An anemic individual or church will do what? They will refuse sound doctrine. I'm not talking about denominational differences. I'm speaking of sound doctrine, which Paul was communicating to Timothy by unction of the Holy Spirit, who was a new young preacher. What would be another reason why a church would spiral into the depths of anemic decay? Listen to this carefully. Write down, number two, write down Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. Now, we just got done reading this, Romans chapter 1, verses 16 through 17. But let's continue on with what is said to the church at Rome. Watch this. Is this happening now? For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against what? All ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who do what? Who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his external power and Godhead, so that, listen, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and in their foolish hearts, and they were was darkened, professing to be wise. They became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image 
made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Here's a big transition beginning with verse 24. Therefore, what's the word therefore, therefore? As a Bible study student, you should always remember when you see the word therefore, it's therefore a reason. And the word therefore is there for a reason. And the reason is what? What was just said. And based on what was just said, therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Who did what? Who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, this is a dangerous place to be. God gave them over to a debased mind. A debased mind is someone who can't reason no more. You can't tell black from white. Everything is all just lukewarm. There's no definitive absolute issue of truth. They've lost their moral compass. And because they gave up God, we just read it, God gave them over to a, ba a debased mind to do what? Things that are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, malice, full of anger, murder, strife, deceit, evil-minded. They are whisperers. They're backbiters. They're haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. Whom knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. I'm coming to a close, I promise. There was another admonishment that Jesus gave to John while he was on the island of Patmos. By the way, if you want to know what Revelation is all about, you'll see it in chapter 1 in the first, few, first few verses. It says it right there. The book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And in the revelation of Jesus Christ, there are things to come. And so it's not just prophetic events. It's the revelation of Jesus and what is happening in the church and what is happening in the last days. In Revelation 2... With verses 1 through 7, Jesus gave these words to John to write to the church at Ephesus. Again, it starts out to the angel. Once again, it's to the authority. It's to the messenger or to the pastor. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things say, He who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. You've tested those who say they are apostles and are not. And I have found them liars. And you have preserved and have patience. And have labored for my name's sake. And have not become weary. Pay attention to this. But nevertheless, I have this against you. That you have lost your first love. Remember therefore from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works. Or else I will come quickly and remove your lampstand from its place. Unless you repent. But this you have that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans which I also he he hate. He who has an ear let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. To him that overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. There's a whole message in there, man, and I got to 
I can't get sidetracked. There's another tree. You know, in the Garden of Eden, there was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You know that, right? You know that story, right? Nod your head, you'll make me feel better. And someone chose to listen to another voice because they were exposed to the knowledge of good and evil. They all of a sudden saw life in a whole different picture. And because of the knowledge of sin of themselves, they hid themselves. When God came in the cool of the day and said, Adam, where are you? Did God already know? I mean, come on. Well, we're in the bushes. Why are y'all hiding? Well, because we're naked. And God said, who told you? That you were naked. There's a whole message in, in that. In God and his sovereign grace and his mercy. In the end of that chapter was the one that gave the first bloodshed. He took the skin of an animal. And he clothed them. With the skin of an animal. The first sacrifice was done by God himself. Because of his mercy and grace. And he covered them in their shame and in their pain until the appropriate time when the gospel would be manifest. An amazing story. So I'm going to close. How many times have I said that now? So what is the way of escape for an anemic church? I believe the last call of God is going forth right now. So let me give you number three to put down and we'll wrap this up. How can a church or an individual walk away and keep away from, the, from an anemic posture as we're living out and waiting for the return of Jesus Christ? Number three, write down this answer, which includes a problem. Write down Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. It's an amazing picture. Like a prescription from a medical doctor, Jesus gives a remedy or a prescription for warfare and victory. Listen to these words. Finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Watch this. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, oh, there's that word again. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. The Bible gives us a prescription. An admonishment to put on the whole armor of God. But you said, Pastor, there's an answer. There's a prescription. But there's also a problem. Yeah, there's a problem. Tucked away right in here. The admonishment is if we put on the whole armor of God, we will be victorious. But God did not create us as robots. He created us with choice. And apparently he gave the angels even choice. Now we can't go there because we already way past run out of time. But apparently in the heavenly realm before God created mankind, the angels, a third of the angels, including Lucifer, now we know as Satan, the angels, a third of the angels chose to rebel against God. Angels rebelled and angels have a choice? According to the word of God, they did. So God gives us a picture of victory, but tucked away in the picture of victory of the whole armor of God, there's a problem. And that problem is choice. 
Now, it's not a problem if we exercise the problem. We exercise the choice. We choose. Admonishment or the promise is to engage or respond in verses 10 and 11. As a result of the response to the promise, we walk in victory. But the potential problem is found in the choice to follow through. Do you know that you have a choice in where you're going to spend eternity? You have a choice right now where you're going to spend eternity. And don't tell me you know that time is running out in your life. You could be a teenager right now and walk out from this building and go down, what is this, 22? And bang, you're gone. There was a recent thing that occurred at a school, a local school. You don't know what's happening. You don't know the day or the hour in which death will come and visit you. So to use the P word, procrastinate, should not be in our vocabulary. If we're not sure, we need to get sure. We need to be ready now. Jesus gave these words as I close again. Therefore, whoever confesses me, listen. If you didn't get anything out of this message, listen to this. Jesus said, whoever confesses me before men... I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Now listen to me as we're closing. The temptation is to defend oneself and to say, wait a minute. I do not deny Jesus. After all, pastor, I'm here. Well, thank you for showing up. But I'd say this, what about your actions, which speech louder than words? Do your actions align with the words of Jesus Christ? In a conversation Jesus had with the Samaritan woman at, the, at a water well, he said these words, John chapter 4, I'd, in, I'd encourage you to go read in context. Jesus said to the woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit and those who Worship him, must worship him in spirit and in truth. If I had time, I would take it, but I don't. There is a vast difference between praise and worship. You come into the church and you praise God for the things that he's done. We praise him for financial answers. We praise him for job employment. We praise him for, for a multitude of things. But worship is a different category. Biblical worship is a lifestyle. Our life is consumed with, with worship. Our life is consumed while a day by day walking in the presence of Jesus Christ. Closing questions, and we're wrapping up. Listen to me, ma'am, sir, boy, or girl. I don't know how you've come in today, I don't know what burdens you're carrying. I don't know what you've gotten from this message. Some of you are probably saying, get on with it, get it over, because we got a potluck to get to. But I want to ask you this question, sir, ma'am. Are you walking in a time of discouragement? Do you just feel beat up? Now, this is a simple answer, but if that's you, Jesus is the answer. Do you feel anemic? Do you feel as though, where's the power that I once knew? The answer is Jesus. Does pistis, faith, dominate your life, or is a pistis more apparent? Then Jesus is the answer because he's the author of saving faith, pistis. According to Hebrews 12.2, Hebrews 12.2 says that, listen, Jesus 
is the author and he's the perfecter of my faith. It comes from one source and one source only. And it comes from Jesus Christ himself. It's more than a belief system, as Jesus' half-brother said. Believing's not enough. Faith without works is dead. And if peace is operating in our lives, there will be a productivity in our lives that we can't stop. It's only him. It's only him. Listen carefully. By the authority of God's word, you're not going to like this. By the authority of God's word, not mine, if, if a peace this, not peace this, if a peace this consumes you, you are not in relationship with God and you are deceived and destined to an eternal hell which was created for the unholy trinity and the fallen angels. I'm just the messenger boy. I'm giving you God's word. I've never heard of the unholy trinity, pastor. But it's so true. Satan, the Antichrist, the false prophet. It's laid out in Revelation chapter 12 and all the way through chapter 13 and Matthew chapter 24 and other places like Daniel 7. The Antichrist is here and he's active, the unholy trinity. And if you, don't, if, if you do not have the holy trinity of God, if you're not walking in peace, this I'm just a blind man helping to give the message to blind people. Because I have, look, as I'm pointing this, I'm not, there's no judgment here. I've got no rocks in my hand to throw. Jesus says, he who is without sin cast the first stone. I have no rocks. I'm just trying to point you because when I point to you, there's three coming back to me. Jesus said, don't go around trying to take a speck out of someone's eye when you've got a beam in your own. How is it possible that we can even see when we've got this beam and I'm looking for a little speck in your eye because I'm the speck police. I want to close. I'm done for this. For real this time. But I'm going to ask you and confront you with a question. Are you sure? Have you taken the yoke of Jesus upon you? Are you sure that you're sure if you were to breathe your last breath that your exhale here will be an inhale of heavenly air? Are you sure? You need to be sure. I had a dear friend who was a pastor. And on Palm Sunday, they listened to a message over the internet that I had given. Palm Sunday. And that person closed their book. They, they loved the message, the triumphal entry. Will you allow the triumphal entry of Jesus to come into your life? And the pastor went into the bed to lay down. And 24 minutes from hanging up the phone, 24 minutes later, laid on the bed, and their life was gone. You don't know, sir, ma'am, boy, girl, how much time you have left. But you better be sure of your destination. And you can be sure by your decision right now. Every head bowed, every eye closed. It's 1130. Thank you for your patience. If you're not sure, you can be sure right now. And I'm going to ask you if you would give this pastor the privilege of praying for you. If you want to be sure that your sins are forgiven... If you want to be sure that Jesus Christ is Lord of your life, then I'm going to ask you for a response because that's what faith is. It's responding in faith. So I'm going to ask you, if you're not sure, you can be sure right now. And if you want the confidence of Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sin, as far as the east is from the west, and for him to take up residence in you, if you want this promise to be true, would you raise your hand right where you're sitting and let me pray for you? Yes, I'm asking you to raise your hand. It's an act of faith, I know. If you're not sure, come on, be sure, would you? Just be sure. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Any more? 
This is your time, 12, 13. The time is now, 14. Jesus Christ is waiting, 15. He's waiting for you, 16, 17. Anybody else? Jump in underneath the spout where the glory comes out, the old timers used to tell me. Now everybody stand, if you would, please. Jesus, you've seen the hearts of your people. More than a hand raised people, us, your, peop your people, and I too raise my hand. Because I need you every day. I need you to expand your presence in my life. I need you to, Jesus, to envelop my vision, to give me spiritual eyes and spiritual ears and the grace and mercy to respond to your word. And I pray for every hand that was raised that you would pour out your Holy Spirit, that you, you would anoint and, and give a burning desire to all of our hands that were raised to have a to have a deep, overwhelming compassion to feast upon your word, to get into your word. I pray for Lone Star Church of the Nazarene that you would pour out your Holy Spirit, that this church would rise once again and be a beacon of light in this community. We're going to be very careful to give you the praise and the honor and the glory, Jesus. And we ask these things in your powerful name. And all God's people said, amen. amen and amen. Well, Lord bless you. If you're able to stay for a meal and fellowship. If not, may God fulfill your day with his presence.